So here is my very basic makeshift optics bench. If we were in a lab classroom, we would be using something called an optics bench, which allows you to mount a lens on it, a viewing screen and a light source. So I'm just using a table lamp that I had at home. This one's got a CFL bulb, sorry, CFL bulb, compact fluorescent light bulb. And I found that that works very well because it's nice and bright for producing an image over here on the viewing screen. This is just a piece of paper that I taped to a manila folder and I wedged it between two bricks that I happen to have in the garage. And I also have the magnifying glass, my $1 converging lens also mounted between a couple bricks elevated by some books. You figure out what works for you. And by the way, please ignore the, uh, the kitchen mess in the background. So you will need the lens, something to view your image on and a light source. Bright is better. You do not need this electric stand mixer in the background, although they are awesome. So what I'm going to do now is turn off the ambient light and turn on my light source. And this light source is the object. You see, if you're indoors, anything else that you use as an object is going to be too dim to produce an image on the screen. Like you could just have a carrot hanging out right here and the ambient light from the room would bounce off the carrot. Some of the rays leaving the carrot would pass through the lens and actually would converge on the viewing screen. But that image would be so dim that it would be washed out by the rest of the ambient light in the room that just happens to be bouncing off the page. So you could do it outside. Outside, um, the sunlight is so bright that it's sufficiently intense to bounce off of an object and actually form an image. But since you'll be doing this likely indoors, you need something really bright for your, excuse me, for your object. So you will need a tape measure. You could do it with a ruler, but then you'd have to pick it up and scoot it a number of times. You'll need to measure the distance from your object to your, let me get out of the way here, to your lens. So from directly beneath the object to where the lens is. And my recommendation is to make that measurement from above. Be looking down on the tape measure or the ruler when you do that. And then you'll need to measure the distance from the lens to the viewing screen, which is of course what we've been calling the image distance. Now you can't tell in this video because it's so, uh, I'm not really sure why, I think it's overexposed. What I can see right now is a very clear image of the CFL bulb. I can see the, the sharp outline of the coiled bulb. Um, everything is very clear. You just see this washed out circle of light. If I were to change the location of the viewing screen, again, you can't tell, but I can tell that the image is no longer in focus because those three distances, S, S prime and F, where S is object distance, S prime is image distance, and F as in Frank is the focal length. Currently, the way I have this set up, those three distances do not satisfy the thin lens equation. If they did, then I would see a sharply focused image on the screen. But the image is instead maybe in front of this folder or even behind it. I, I, uh, I would have to do the math to figure out for sure. But you'll just have to scoot your viewing screen back and forth until you get the image sharpened. And then you know that the distance from the lens to the viewing screen really is the image distance. You could also change the position of the lens, in which case you're changing S and S prime simultaneously. So either shift the lens around or shift the viewing screen around or both until you get a sharp image and then you'll have to measure S and S prime. And you'll be using the spreadsheet or your hand calculator to calculate the focal length for each pair of values S and S prime. In addition to determining the focal length using the five trials in your spreadsheet, you can also, or you should also do what I will call the alternate method, which is just to go outside with the lens and use the sun as the object. Now, the sun is not infinitely far away. It's something like 150 million kilometers from us, but that's basically infinity. In fact, you don't have to be anywhere near that far 
uh, to call it infinity as far as the thin lens equation is concerned. So here the object distance is infinity. And when you look at the thin lens equation, you'll see that that means in this scenario, the image distance is really the same as the focal length. So here I'm making an image of the sun on that sheet of paper. A lot of you probably did this as kids. Um, so you just have to measure the distance from the lens to that bright dot. And if you've never done this before, seriously, don't look directly at it because you're gonna see that white dot for the next hour uh, as your, uh, what is it? the the fatigue of the sensory cells in your retina goes away. In any case, if you don't want to do that because uh, you don't want to look at that bright spot or you're worried about starting a fire, which is actually possible, you could do this as well. Here I'm standing near an open doorway that's facing the sky, and the sky is sufficiently bright during the day that I can actually see the image that it forms on the paper here. Where's my laser pointer? So these clouds, again, not infinitely far away, but far enough that it may as well be an infinity as far as the thin lens equation is concerned. So look at the equation again. If you plug in infinity for the object distance, you'll find that the focal length is basically the same as the image distance. So measure the distance from your lens to that image. That's another value for the focal length. And this is what I'm calling F alt for alternate in the spreadsheet. Here's an overhead shot of my setup. Remember the light bulb itself is the object unless you do another thing that I'm going to suggest in a moment, which is to put a sheet of paper over the lamp and draw something on it, in which case the illuminated drawing would be your object. Now you wanna be very uh, clear about what your object is because you need to know the exact location of the object when you go to measure the object distance. The object distance is from the object to the lens. And different parts of the light bulb will focus at slightly different locations. You know, we haven't really used this phrase much, but focal plane is really the plane of this viewing screen. And because the light bulb has, has some depth here, the back of the bulb is going to have a different focal plane than the front of the bulb. So decide which part of the bulb you're looking for on the viewing screen, I would just choose the, the very front of the bulb. Make sure that that's the part that's um, focused most sharply on your viewing screen. So this is S, the object distance. And then this distance will be S prime. That's the image distance, the distance from the lens to the, uh, to the real image. This is a real image that we're forming here on the viewing screen. My tape measure uh, used inches. Hopefully you've got one in centimeters. It really doesn't matter. If all you have is a tape measure that measures in inches, go ahead and put inches in your spreadsheet. Just make sure that you update the units so I know which ones you're using in the spreadsheet. Um, the disadvantage, of course, with the imperial system is having to um, estimate the, you know, to the nearest eighth or sixteenth, and then you'd have to convert that to a decimal, which creates some issues with um, significant digits. I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. It's not that important. Okay, so obviously you'd wanna stretch the tape measure from the center of the lens holder to the, the sheet of paper there when you're measuring the image distance. Here's a look back from the lens at the object. If you don't put a piece of paper with the drawing over the lamp, then the, the light bulb itself will be the object. Okay, I mentioned in the video or earlier in the video that I could tell when the image was focused, but you couldn't. Now you can see very clearly, this is a sharply focused image of my object, which is the light bulb itself. And you can see that the, the very front of the bulb is sharply focused. The second coil behind, not so much. Remember, if, if your object has any depth at all, each part of it's gonna have a different focal plane. Let's go with the front of the light bulb. So. Here, my viewing, screen, my viewing screen was not in the correct location to satisfy the thin lens equation. So wherever the image was being focused, it wasn't on the piece of paper, it was behind it or in front of it. So here's what I recommend. And there's no safety hazard here if you're using an LED light or even a CFL bulb because those really don't get that hot. 
if you're using an older incandescent bulb, uh, I guess there's a chance your piece of paper could get hot enough to combust. So be careful with that. I don't want to be responsible for burning your home down. But if you want to use letters, you have to write them backwards and then flip them upside down if you want the image to, to be legible like this because the lens will reverse left to right and up up and down. You already know that, right? You know that for a converging lens, a real image will be inverted. Well, that's inverted top to bottom, but if you think about it, there's nothing special about top to bottom. Um, that's just the direction of gravity, but the gravitational field has nothing to do with the action of the lens. So you really should have um, inversion about any axis or along any axis, I suppose you should say. Now, I don't really care uh, if the letters are legible or not, because <clears throat> I, I am going to ask you to take a couple pictures of your setup and include that with your submission, since y'all have smartphones anyway. So the advantage of, of using letters, or you could even just draw an arrow, that would be fine. That makes it easy to, um, to measure the object height. So if I want to use the letter I here as my object, which is what I actually did for one of my trials, I would measure that, and you only have to do that once if you use that as your object every time, which you should. But then you can measure the image height, which would be the height of the letter I on the viewing screen. And if you've got any magnification at all, of course, those two heights will be different. So uh, actually, an arrow would be better because when, when I draw the letter, I didn't draw it perfectly. So the height on the left side is probably a little different than the height on the right side. So maybe just get out a ruler and draw like a, a one inch or two inch mark. You can put an arrowhead on it if you want to, to make it obvious that it's been inverted. I don't care what you do. You could, you could print, a, print out a picture of yourself and put it on that piece of paper. I don't know if it would be illuminated enough. I'm back in Excel once again. I'll provide a template to you that looks basically like this and you can fill it in yourselves. You just have to measure the height of your object once. That's the bulb itself, if you're not gonna cover it with a piece of paper or the arrow, if you use that suggestion. And I actually used inches here, which is why I've got this number with four sig figs, because what I did was estimate uh, a length to the nearest, I think 16th of an inch, because my, my measuring tape has um, markings down to the nearest 16th of an inch. If you're gonna use inches, like I said, go, go through and change all of these uh, unit labels. I think five trials is a good number. In each case, you've got, what is it, six cells that you have to fill in. Tell me the object distance, how far the, uh, the arrow or the light bulb itself was from the lens, how far the focused image was from the lens. And then here's where you would calculate the focal length. And I'm not gonna click on this cell because if I do, you'll see the formula I used. But I want you to figure it out yourself because it's so difficult right, to figure out how to implement the, the thin lens equation appropriately to calculate the focal length. The height here is something that you would measure, not calculate. That's the, the height of the magnified. It might be shrunken, but the magnified or shrunken image on the viewing screen. And then here, you will refer to two previous cells. Just take the image distance and divide it by the object distance to calculate that ratio. Because if you'll recall, from our basic theory or our elementary theory of ray optics, the image and object distance ratio should be the same as the ratio, at least if you're talking about um, absolute values, it should be the same as the ratio of the heights. So you can revisit that topic in your book if you'd like, but we're looking to see that these ratios come out similar to each other. And they did for me. I only did one trial completely. And I did find that when I divided uh, the height of the, the letter I I showed you by the, the actual height of the letter I that I had drawn on the paper. Uh, I got this ratio, whoops, right here. I got this ratio here, which just happens to be very close to the ratio of image distance to object distance. So these you can enter as formulas and you know do the thing where you double click to, to iterate the formula down all five rows. There's not much else here. Uh, you'll note that for each trial, trial, you're getting a separate value of the focal length. Now, 
it looks like I got exactly the same number each time. That's because I adjusted the number of sig figs. So if I leave more decimal places, you can see that I didn't get the exact same value every time. But I think you know we only need to keep the the nearest, or we only need to keep the tenths place anyway because. If you're measuring with a tape measure, you're not making ultra precise measurements of distance anyway. Not only that, but um, the the actual image distance that you measure that's going to take some judgment from your your eyeball, right? If you were doing this lab with somebody else, they might think that the the image looked a little bit more focused if you scoot the page back by one millimeter. There might be some small disagreement there. So so there's obviously experimental error here, which is why we don't need to keep a bunch of digits in these cells. So I will be looking to see that you kept a reasonable number of digits. If you've got like six decimal places, I'm going to have to get irritated and subtract like at least a millipoint of credit, maybe more. How much more? I'm not going to say, but uh, so down here, F average, this is where you will just average your five values for the focal length. And then direct, directly below it, you can enter the alternate value that you got from the other method, right? When you went outside and burned ants. No, don't do that. Don't don't torture insects with your magnifying glass. But uh, you could do a percent error between these two, whatever. I, I'm just looking to see that, th that they come out similar. So I know that you did this correctly. And then finally, the idea here is you really will do six trials. The first five trials you're using to get a good average value for the focal length. Then you're really confident that you have a good value for the focal length and you can now predict where the final image should be. So you'll pick a sixth object distance. Uh, move, go ahead and move the lens around or move the viewing screen around until you get the image focused. Go ahead and measure that. And then actually predict where the image should be located using the value of the focal length that you're confident about it. So these two numbers should, of course, agree. In your sixth trial, to summarize here, you're predicting where that sixth image should be. Then you go ahead and fiddle with the setup until you get it focused. Compare those two values. You know, percent difference. We're not doing error analysis here, so we can't say anything meaningful about whether the percent difference is acceptable or not. But you know, if you get a fifty percent error, that's not good. I have to tell students every semester that the goal is not a hundred percent error. Right? You don't want a hundred percent. You want it to be closer to zero. So use your judgment about whether that number came out reasonable. If it's way off, then you did something wrong. So go back and revisit your process. So later I'll come back and give some more instructions about this, uh, a similar procedure with a diverging lens. I think we're going to use reading glasses from the pharmacy because you can pick those up for a couple bucks. So after you've completed this spreadsheet, what you can do later is just add another sheet to the same Excel file and, and enter the data for your diverging lens, which is a little trickier conceptually. Okay, am I missing anything here? I think one thing I forgot to point out is that when you're changing S and S prime, because you need to have a different setup each time, it doesn't have to be wildly different. You'll probably discover that if you put the, if you put the object, which is your light bulb or your illuminated arrow too close to the focal point, then your image ends up really far away. You know, I'm just using my kitchen countertop here, but if your image is far enough away, you're going to have to use like some outdoor space and you're totally welcome to do that. You, you might want to get creative and use a bright flashlight even as your object. You could take a, an erasable marker and even draw on the flashlight glass that's over the lens. And, you know, because LED flashlights that you buy now are bright enough to produce images a hundred yards away. So you could do that if you wanted, but you'd have to have some precise way of measuring the distance. So do whatever you want, as long as the data is clear here. And these five trials need to be different. They don't need to be wildly different, but different enough. And yeah, so the thing I was gonna mention is, earlier in the video, I said you can scoot the lens around or you can scoot, scoot the viewing screen around. You could also just scoot the light source back. That's another way of changing S, right? Scooting the object back effectively changes the uh, object distance, just as would moving the lens forward or backwards. Okay, so that's it. It's really a simple lab, right? There's not a whole lot here. We're just confirming that the thin lens equation works, which is cool because if you go back to the chapters on optics, there was quite a bit of 
trigonometry that went into the thin lens equation. First, we looked at refraction at a spherical boundary, uh, you know, interface between two different media like air and glass. And then we stuck two of those spherical boundaries interfaces together to make a lens. And we used the small angle approximation. There was a lot that went into deriving that very simple result that we call the thin lens equation. And after you've done this lab, you'll be convinced that, hey, it actually works really well.